I could do what that guy did, you know. I just thought I was showing off. <laughs> he just used his fingers. I mean, really. I got to tell you what's most exciting about today, that they're on time. And I also must tell you this, that when the students ask if I would do a little speech, that I thought, well, of course I'll do a little speech. As a matter of fact, if you all asked me today, right this minute, to do a three-hour speech, I could start that. The unfortunate thing is they asked me to do a 15-minute speech. And for that, along with FDR, I would have needed months to prepare. Um, it is true I've been here 40 years. I thank you so much for mentioning that. Um, <laughs> and more importantly, I certainly never came to be on a nursing faculty. No one is ever more surprised than I when I wake up every morning and am on the nursing faculty. Uh, I intended to be a very famous musical theater and dance star. I didn't realize talent was a, re a prerequisite. <laughs> but I was raised by an absolutely magnificent set of parents. I'm a northerner. Any northerners? Let me just see a couple northerners. What do you call northern? Really? You think D.C. is northern? Where are the Wisconsin and Madison people? What was that? You don't remember? Where are you from? And you think that's northern. Does East sound like anything? No Michigan, no Wisconsin, no Madison. How about any Scandinavians, just for the record? Any Scandinavians in the audience? And that's where they sit, always in the back. <laughs> and they don't really raise their hand. That was pretty good. Usually they... As a matter of fact, Mark and his father used to have this thing. If they ever thought there was going to be audience participation, just as it began, Felix would say to Mark, shoes. Then they would both tie their shoes so they wouldn't be involved with the audience participation. Well, when you live in Wisconsin and have Scandinavian parents as I do, my parents are still alive in their 90s um, and can beat me at all card games. Even with dementia, they can beat me at all card games. Generally, Scandinavians don't, are real eager about their children being musical theater and dance stars. Um, but they were wonderful parents, and so they encouraged me. I took dance from K through 12. How many of you took dance when you were little? Let me just see. Yeah, every small town in America. Exactly, Val. And now you make movies. What's the deal? Every small town in America has some Caucasic Russian woman, <laughs> gathers up all the little goslings, puts them in tutus, sends them out on a stage where they wave to the parents who say, yep, that's worth $75 a month. Um, <laughs> I am certainly no exception to that. I took that from K through 12. Um, but I come from a family in Scandinavia. We, we were very low key. If you don't believe it, look at our food. If we can't parboil it or blanch it, we're covering it with a white sauce. Um, my mother in her 90s has been part of the Lutheran Wednesday night potluck supper, yay, these last 65 years, usually the salad committee. Uh, inevitably, that's red jello with mayonnaise. Some, some weeks, it's very, it's wild, she's like on the dessert committee, which of course is red jello with fruit cocktail. Um, <laughs> and I was raised by cliche. How many of you were raised by cliche? Your mother had rules for everything. Yeah, don't make me say this again. Great, wish you hadn't said it the first damn time. <laughs> You're skating on thin ice, young lady. Don't make me count to three. Um, I had a little brother and I thought that it was important on a daily basis to gather up his transgressions and report them to my mother at the end of each day, hoping for a great physical punishment. And I would tell her all the things that Tommy had done, and inevitably she would say, well, let's face it, that's life. Life is what you make it. Make the best of it. Now go outside and find yourself something to do. That really never felt very satisfying to me. Um, and I was a doctoral student in psychology before I realized that life is what you make it, make the best of it, made my mother the original Jungian psychologist. <laughs> so, of course, when I was a senior in high school, I applied to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, at that time, largest university in America, 50-some thousand students. I applied to the BFA program, bachelor program uh, of fine arts, and I was accepted to the university, told I was going to have to come down and audition for a slot in the BFA program. Great, been auditioning my whole life. Um, and if you see the movie Fargo, because that's really kind of my life. Um, 
And I was the first grandchild going to college, and everybody was so proud they felt they should come along. <laughs> Made a little sign, said something like, go Sally, go Ufta. And um, I'd actually been agonizing about going to this audition because I come from a one-car family. Any of you come from a one-car family? See, it doesn't happen much anymore. Not only that, I came from a one-car family, and my father was a builder in a town that had a paper mill. And if you know anything about Wisconsin weather, only a good day to build, 4th of July. <laughs> Holiday, you got to take it off. So we were wretchedly poor. And every day he would take me to high school in that car that he used for building. And I would say things like, why don't you just leave me off down the block? I need the exercise. I'll walk. And he'd say, now, ain't that a crazy thingy? She cripes now, you know. It's too cold for that. Let me take you right to the front door. And we drove up in a big 55 Oldsmobile, looked like a great rust tooth monster, chewed along the bottom. Two by fours hanging out of the side windows. Red kerchief on the end. Power tools in the trunk held together with wire and rope. Stuffing coming out of the upholstery that he would cover with a blanket and inevitably close the blanket in the door. As we drove up to the high school, that blanket would be dragging along outside. <laughs> and he wore a hat with ear flaps. Dad, come on in and meet my friends. <laughs> and so I've been agonized about this. And the day before the audition, I got home, and my parents were sitting on the couch, and my father had his arm around my mother, and he said, we have good news. And because I was a teenager, any of you parents of teenagers here? OK, this is my impression of a teenager. That is the world revolving around them. I figured if they had good news, it must be about me. Why else would I want to hear it? <laughs> this isn't only good news, it's great news, so I made the obvious leap that they had bought me a car. <laughs> Not only great news, but exquisite news, and I was stunned they would get me a convertible in Wisconsin. <laughs> and my sweet father said to me, your mother and I are going to have a baby. I was a senior in high school. Do you know what it's like to have your mother go to your high school graduation in maternity clothes? <laughs> a public proclamation that your parents do it? <laughs> I went down, gave the audition of a lifetime. Before we even got home, they called my dad, Mr. Peterson, great news, your kid got one of the slots. And after everything else, you will only owe an additional $2,000 a semester. And I thought the look on his face was joy, but I didn't care, because soon I would be famous, and I would not have to deal with Friday night fish ever again. <laughs> and the only thing left between me and stardom was awards night. Do you remember awards night when you graduated from high school? What's the name of the person in your class that got all the awards? And you're going to say you, aren't you? <laughs> Who got them? Johnny. That damn Johnny. Got the math award, got the Woodman award, got the best student award. After a while, you drag some of John's stuff under your chair so it looked like you got a little something. <laughs> I got the American Legion award. And you get the American Legion award? Absolutely. Give, same woman gave it to you and me, great bosomed woman. <laughs> Hair color of which doesn't exist anywhere in nature. <laughs> Red, white, and blue, triple note student, gave me a little pin, 50 bucks. I was ready to leave. But because I lived in a mill town, there was a family called the Cress family, and they, in fact, Gave a scholarship each year that was magnificent. Paid for three complete years of college. Room, board, tuition, books. And in 1964, a $25 a week allowance. Stunning. Still, best ever. The only kind of drawback was, it wasn't to the college of your choice. It was to the college of their choice. And the college of their choice was a tiny, private, Religious, all girls, hospital nursing school in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And all day we'd been laughing about who we thought was going to get the Crest Foundation scholarship. We figured it would go to Phyllis Esvelt because she was already wearing those crepe soled shoes. <laughs> and Mrs. Crest got up to give the award and she said, This year's winner doesn't look like any of the rest. And we went, You bet that is Phyllis in those ugly shoes. She said, this year's winner has been in every play the school has ever done. 
and I didn't remember Phyllis being in the plays with me. <laughs> Homecoming, cheerleading. And when they announced my name, I realized I would have to go up and accept it. Another one of my mother's cliches, there's no excuse for bad manners. I thought I will accept it today. I will give it back tomorrow. <laughs> and that night when I got home, my parents were once more sitting on the couch, only this time I was a little more leery. And my sweet father said to me, darling, mommy and I don't know if you know this or not, but lately in the deep of night, you have been waking up from a sound sleep and crying out, oh, please let me be a nurse. <laughs> so you hate to go against the gods. So I headed off to Green Bay at that time, Green Bay, the entire population of the town, same as UW-Madison, but the greatest thing happened, I started nursing school and I loved it. The most interesting thing that happened is I began taking care of patients. My grandmother had been a nurse. I kind of laugh, but nowadays I have some nursing students in the audience here. My grandmother used to take me with her when, when she went to see patients. And now we talk about holistic care, multicultural care, individualized care. Um, that's all it ever used to be. We're acting like we just came up with it. And I had patients who were very ill. And what became very clear to me, there were a couple of researchers later who actually named this phenomenon, but the sicker a patient was, the more we acted like everything was fine. It became known as the ritual drama of ritual pretense, where the patient knew he was dying, the family knew he was dying, the staff knew he was dying, and we all act like it was going to live forever. I guess if I could stamp something out of the English language, it would be when someone says, you know, she's dying with cancer. No, she's really not. She's really living with cancer. And she's doing it with stunning grace and dignity. And what I began to see is these patients that weren't given the truth. And so they didn't have time to, to reconcile or to, to take care of unfinished business. And what we stole from the families is the very last gift any of us have to give to someone we love who may leave us, which is permission to go. The day they say, I don't want any more chemo, and I don't want any more surgery, and I don't want any more radiation, then what we say is, I can't imagine a world without you in it, but if you need to go, we're going to be okay here. That's the gift we have to give, and we didn't do it. And off I went to UW and got an undergraduate degree in theater, but was no good, and got my baccalaureate degree Heard a woman named Elizabeth Kubler-Ross as she talked about being able to talk honestly with patients. And I'd married my acting teacher. My parents were happy at the age of 20 that I married my 42-year-old acting teacher. Was his third wife, the first two Vegas showgirls. <laughs> with children older than I. And he accepted a job at a place called Florida State University. So in 1970, I arrived here, and I thought, I'll get a graduate degree in nursing. And I went over to the nursing school, and I said, I'd like to get a graduate degree in nursing. And she said, we don't have a graduate program where one faculty member short. Do you want the job? And I wasn't doing anything else that day. <laughs> and that was 40 years ago. And I have spent my 40 years being humbled by what I see families in profound situations doing every day, their grace, their dignity. And I've changed my thinking about end-of-life issues. We, we started a decade ago looking at something called compassion fatigue, how, how we get sad when we watch other patients who are sad. And I realized, why are we studying them? Why aren't we studying the people with compassion energy? Those of you that are innervated by what the patients do, what we see them managing every day against all odds, when we see them exquisitely manage the most unmanageable things. And I realize that compassion energy is what you take home because you're joyous about the patient you've left, not because they've overwhelmed you. I talk a lot about advanced directives. I brought for you all today some copies, both in, in Spanish and in English. If you have not done 
advanced directives, I am begging you all, the greatest gift you give a family is your end of life directives. These are five wishes forms and they were actually begun in Florida. But you need a living will and a durable power of attorney. You need to tell people what you want at the end so that they aren't overwhelmed by the sadness. You need to give up worry and guilt and get on with their lives. How many are warriors? Let me see warriors. Professional warriors. Those of you, if you haven't worried, it worries you. <laughs> I am not a worrier, though in my office where we do speaking right after 911. I came in one day and my office said, we've canceled all of your international speeches for the fall. And I said, well, then you've canceled your salaries. And they said, no, we're serious. And I said, as am I. And then we discussed a while, and finally I said, what are the odds I'm going to be on a plane this fall where someone has a bomb, and our statistician said probably about 1 in 200, and I went, woo. Okay, well, what are the odds I'm going to be on a plane where two people have a bomb? <laughs> and he said, well, about 1 in a billion. So I never go anywhere without that bomb. And that's a trick to life, folks. <laughs> I can't think of anything worse than getting to the end of your life and wanting to do over. With all my patients, I've never had anyone look at me before they died and said, gee, I wish I'd spent more time at the office. So here's the deal. No guilt, no worry, no why me, because that's how it works in an imperfect world. Every single day you get up, and it is a stunning, stunning gift. You put together those exquisite moments like right here and right now. You recognize what you have been given. And in the end, I guess what I've always said is, you've got to enjoy life. Because as best I can tell, this probably isn't a dress rehearsal. Thanks.